Hi and welcome to another edition of Showcase coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. We have an action-packed and movie-filled show for you today. Later in the program, we'll see why Kill Bill was possibly Quentin Tarantino's best production yet and find out how Christian Bale transforms into one of the most controversial politicians in U.S. history for his latest role in Vice. But first... What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! We take a look at what the Me Too movement accomplished in just one year. A surrealist master in Paris. A retrospective of Joan Miro's dreamy, poetic paintings are on show. Not too many artists have had an impact on modern art like Joan Miro. The Spanish painter and sculptor pushed the limits of abstraction and bent it into its current form. And now, a retrospective in Paris features some of his most extraordinary works. The doors of the Grand Palais in Paris opens to the poetic universe of Joan Miro. The exhibition presents nearly 150 works of the Spanish artist. From his early years when he primarily painted landscapes and everyday scenes, to his mature style where he depicted the harshness of modern life with a fanciful impulse. It's exceptional because the exhibit brings together Miro's whole life and shows us seven decades of creation from the beginning to the end, as well as risks taken by an artist who always questioned himself and ended up giving 20th century painting an entire new language. It was neither abstract nor figurative. He turned to the earth and the sky to tell us that what he was really offering us was a poetic language. The retrospective also features his Blue series, which Miro called the synthesis of everything he had ever attempted to do. He once said, when I need a starting point, the smallest grain of sand or ray of light can cause something extraordinary inside me. And it really was that. He knew how to capture that truth make it available to us and with extreme generosity offer us a world that belongs to him. And this made him a unique figure of the 20th century. I remember a violent gesture he had. He would apply all the force in his hand on his drawing pencil and of course the pencil would break. It was a powerful gesture but one that was completely automatic and out of his control. Miro once said, a painting should be like sparks. It should dazzle you like the beauty of a woman or a poem. And true to that spirit, the exhibition also seeks to fascinate while tracing the technical and stylistic evolution of the surrealist master. Just over a year ago, women in Hollywood finally stood up to the sexual harassment and assault they experienced at the hands of colleagues and Tinseltown moguls. Millions of women chimed in on social media to share their stories with the hashtag MeToo. What followed was a crackdown on the power players of Hollywood previously thought to be untouchable. The movement gained international support and helped bring the wrongdoers to face justice. It has been more than a year since the first wave of women came forward, outing Harvey Weinstein's sexual misconduct. Joining me now to examine the Me Too movement is Caitlin Regyash, who is a gender theorist and lecturer in digital culture and media at the University of Kent. Thank you so much for being with us today, Caitlin. Now, as we said, it's been a whole year since the Me Too movement made waves across social media and into mainstream life now. Tell me why this movement is so significant today. Well, let's take a look at what happened a year ago. As you mentioned, on the 5th of October 2017, the New York Times came forward with allegations of sexual assault against Harvey Weinstein. Ten days later, Alyssa Milano uses a term that was actually founded in 2006, Me Too, and she asks women to voice their experience of sexual assault. In one day, on that one day, the 15th of October, 2017, the term Me Too was used two, uh, sorry, 12 million times on Facebook. 
and that was just in one day. And from there, we saw a real revolution of social change come forth. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to my next question then. Uh, movements like this on social media and on digital platforms can actually uh, cause a, and make change in real life situations. Yeah, absolutely. I think it depends on how we define change. You know, have we seen substantial policy change? Not so much. You know, did Brett Kavanaugh get sworn in yesterday? Yes, he did. But we now have a reference point. Uh, things that used to be kind of a perk of the job a year ago are now considered to be sexual violence. And we're now having a much more open discussion about sexual violence, which is really important. Now, some people are saying that men have been left out of this conversation. Do you think that there is a mm -hmm. space for men in this conversa conversation? Absolutely. I, I think that I look at Me Too as a period of revolution where particularly women aired their wounds. We took evil monarchs to the guillotine. We fought. Um, but with any revolution, you want real social change to take place. I'd like that social change to look like more open discussions about uh, sexuality and sex. Um, I think that we need to be looking at how we define consent. Mm -hmm. And in order for that to take place, we need to include men in the discussion. It, 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 that change can't happen if men aren't involved in it. Now, I also want to go back to this question about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I also want to go back to this question about policy change. I think it's very easy to say, well, what has actually really happened? But for any policy change to take place, public opinion has to change first. Right? So if we look at the United States, Obama once said that he could never have legalized gay marriage if it wasn't for the Ellen DeGeneres show. Mm -hmm. right? So social norms have to change before we see policy follow. And that's what Me Too is doing. Mm -hmm. It does indeed. Uh, now, Caitlin, what's mm -hmm. next? Where, we, where do we go from here? I think we need to continue to have this discussion. As I said, if we want to have more open, more honest and healthy discussions about relationships, we need to allow the space that breaks the silence, that breaks the stigma, and ultimately this should lead to better relationships between men and women. It should indeed. Caitlin, Unfortunately, I'm going to have to end that there, but thank you so much for being with us today on Showcase and sharing that information with us on the Me Too movement. Thank you so much for having me. Still to come on Showcase, why we can never get tired of Tarantino. One tick to Tokyo, please. One way. You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? For a second, going in for the kill. On its 15th anniversary, we look back on one of the bloodiest films ever made. Did you just take my picture? Erase it. I guess I'm probably not the kind of person you're normally friends with. Oh, you do not want to be friends with me. Trust me. A simple favor. Can you Spoiler alert, this movie has it all. Secrets, plot twists, and a mysterious disappearance. I can handle the more mundane jobs, overseeing bureaucracy, military, energy, and uh, foreign policy. From Batman to a bad man. Good luck trying to recognize Christian Bale in his latest movie, Vice. But first, let's take a look at what's making headlines in arts and culture. The International Bosphorus Film Festival is about to return for the sixth time and it's just released its lineup of competing films. It includes Turkish director Mahmut Fazıl Coşkun's The Announcement, which recently premiered at the Venice Film Festival. The opening film will be David Lowry's The Old Man and the Gun, featuring Robert Redford's last acting performance. The festival begins on October 26. Turkey is set to have a new museum with a unique design inspired by the clash of two giant waves. 
Located by the country's northern shores, Samsun's Ethnography and Archaeology Museum will feature over 18,000 artifacts. The museum is expected to be complete by February 2019. Palestinian artist Rowan Abu Ghosh has designed an attire in support of Palestinians detained in Israeli prisons. Her design, meshed with wire, portrays the physical decline of Palestinians during their time behind bars. Abu Ghosh's piece can be seen at the Kalandia International Festival until the end of this month. While many films go on to become classics, not everybody can do it like Quentin Tarantino, especially considering he's a self-confessed thief. And it was in 2003 that he decided to give something back from the spoils of 1970s kung fu flicks with a bold film about a bride out on a slashing trail of murderous revenge. Come on. Not too long ago, I was quite the professional. It's been 15 years since Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volume 1 sliced its way into multiplexes. With an estimated budget of $30 million, it went on to gross $181 million worldwide. The cast includes regular collaborators Michael Madsen, Samuel L. Jackson and Uma Thurman, whose role in the film goes beyond the bride. I guess they should have tried a little harder. Tarantino came up with Kill Bill during the filming of Pulp Fiction, when he told Thurman how much he loved 70s kung fu films. Thurman gave him an idea for an opening scene. Tarantino went on to write the script using elements from Pulp Fiction, like the Fox Force 5, which is the basis of the deadly Viper assassination squad in Kill Bill. You got a corpse in a car, minus a head in a garage. Take me to it. Mother... Tarantino has confessed to stealing ideas from world cinema. And to some, Kill Bill's biggest influence is the 1973 Japanese film Lady Snowblood, where the female lead is out on a killing spree to avenge the murder of her parents. <laughs> There are also stylistic similarities, such as camera angles, freeze frames and chapter divisions, as well as the fight scene in a snowy garden. Kill Bill draws from films of a range of genres, from the 1928's The Farmer's Wife to the 2000's Battle Royale, not to mention the Bruce Lee-inspired outfit from The Game of Death. While originally written as one, the film was later split into two volumes, giving Tarantino a chance to delve into the characters' backstories. And way back in 2004, the director flirted with the idea of a third. You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? I've got the whole mythology, you know, down, so I could do a few different things. I could do some graphic novels, I could do an anime prequel kind of thing. But as far as, like, actually me and Uma getting together and doing another movie, we might, but it would be, like, way, way, way down the line. And many fans feel it's about time. Yeah, I kind of did. Silly rabbit. Joining me now from London to talk about Kill Bill and what to expect from Quentin Tarantino in the future is Ian Nathan. He is an author and film critic who is writing a book titled Quentin Tarantino, the iconic filmmaker and his work that will be published soon. Thanks for being with us today, Ian. Now tell me why Kill Bill is still important 15 years on uh, for the cinematic industry and for Quentin Tarantino's career itself. What makes Kill Bill so interesting is that it, it came after quite a break in, in kind of the Tarantino career. He had made this incredible impact off the back of Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction and become fated as the kind of the great revolution in Hollywood. And then he'd made Jackie Brown, which is slightly more subdued but very well received film. Then he kind of went missing. He kind of went off on his own and he wrote and he, he kind of went on what he called a personal hiatus. And he came back almost six years since he had last made a film was this thing called Kill Bill. And what it was was almost a revolution in Tarantino terms. It was his first action film. And when he meant action film, that wasn't in any kind of Hollywood sense. What he set out to make was an, a, a kind of 
sort of molten amalgam of all these kind of fantastic Chinese and Hong Kong movies he'd watched growing up. Mm -hmm. It would be the ultimate martial arts film. But it was kind of quite interesting is that actually the whole film was dreamed up while they were, he and Uma Thurman were shooting Pulp Fiction. And they would kind of get together in the bar after a day's filming. And they started to dream up this great revenge saga uh, in which the character that Uma Thurman invented called The Bride who would be kind of betrayed by her former squad of assassins. Mm -hmm. And then she would go on this kind of, as, as the film says, this kind of rip-roaring rampage of revenge, which she kind of returns to kind of take them off one by one. And this kind of swelled into this astonishing kind of almost musical-like flurry of action set mm -hmm. pieces and violence and reverence to old films. Well, Ian, it was so big it had to be divided into two films. Yes, sorry. Ian, tell me what's so special about uh, Tarantino's signature filmmaking style? Ah, well, I think it's at the heart of Tarantino is this kind of, he grew up not as a film student, but as a guy who went to the movies. So his movies are built out of other films. He just watches everything. And it's a kind of reverential style that's mixed also with this, I suppose, almost contradictory novelistic-like approach to, to film. He loves talk. He loves characters. He loves scenes where things don't happen rather than when they do. He loves people kind of sitting around talking about the kind of film they're in, play to this kind of very offbeat sort of sense of humor. But he's really good on sort of landscape of places, everything from Los Angeles to World War II and Inglorious Bastards. He's very good on kind of the texture of filmmaking. So you get kind of different styles like Kill Bill and Grindhouse and the Westerns like Hateful Eight and Django Unchained. Yet all of these films are united by this kind of crystalline Tarantino-esque style that's uniquely his own. How does he manage to do that? How does he manage to create films that are so unique um, but are so different from each other? Well, I think uh, fundamentally it's single-mindedness. He wrote all these scripts, he writes all the scripts himself, so they are very much conjoined between writer and director or the same person. And as he came up to become a filmmaker, he was determined to do things his own way. Uh, and, you know, from Reservoir, Dog, Reservoir Dogs onwards, given what a hit it was, he kind of gained that power. I think if it hadn't been really for Pulp Fiction, though, that became such a mega hit, he was able then to kind of invent his own career and set his own rules and mm. then for only make films that were kind of unfilmed to Quentin Tarantino. But do you think that's kind of making him, uh, making him become a cookie cutter in some kind of a way? Uh, I suppose there is that argument that you always kind of know what you're going to get, but, but isn't that the kind of the argument of the auteur theory? It's like if a filmmaker has such a defined style as directors as diverse as Goddard and Scorsese do, then should we fault them for it? Certainly there is a Tarantino style, but it can be used in such different ways. I mean, Hateful Eight is so wildly different from Kill Bill, and Glorious Bastards is hugely different from Reservoir Dogs. Yet I love the fact that I know they're all Quentin Tarantino films. Mm -hmm. um, now, Ian, like I said earlier, you have uh, written a book about Quentin Tarantino, about his filmmaking and um, Quentin Tarantino himself. What made you pen a book about him? Um, one of the reasons really was I'm, I'm a fan. Um, another reason was it felt like uh, it was a good time to look back across the career. He, is, he once said he's only going to make 10 films. I don't know whether he's ever going to stick to this, but he said he's only going to direct 10 films because he doesn't want to kind of be one of those old directors who's just churning out mediocre work in his late career. So we're now kind of approaching his ninth film with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I kind of felt what a good time this was to kind of just sort of report back on the great 90s revolution that Tarantino was and the kind of filmmaker he became after that. But to kind of maybe just take a sort of more distant view of the whole career. Now, like you just said, we're approaching his ninth film. Tell me a bit about that project of his. Well, it couldn't sound more exciting. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the title itself is a riff on Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, and Sergio Leone is uh, Tarantino's favorite filmmaker. And everything Tarantino makes is, in one kind of level, a spaghetti western. It may be different genres, but they're all spaghetti westerns. That's what goes on in Tarantino's head, anyway. And here is a film uh, back in L.A. We've not been there since Pulp Fiction. It's a film set in the late 60s, but it's Quentin Tarantino on Hollywood. It's Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt as his kind of uh, actor and his stuntmen who have left a, a Western television series, a little bit like Bonanza. Um, and they're going to try, he's going to go out and try and make his way in the business. So it's kind of echoes of Tarantino's own career, 
Plus, it's all going to be set against the kind of backdrop of the Charles Manson murders, which were happening in L.A. at the time. So this is kind of wonderful texture for a film to be set in. I'm sure it'll have all those kind of Tarantino-like beats, you know, lots of different kind of storylines intersecting, timeline being mixed up, lots of kind of humor. I can't wait. Oh, we can't wait either here at Showcase. Ian Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today to speak about Quentin Tarantino and, of course, his greatest production of Kill Bill. Thank you. If you're still a little heartbroken at having to say goodbye to summer, here's some good news. The season for the best movies is just around the corner. This next story is about a particular film that's calling on lovers of suspense to solve a mystery with a ton of twists. Have a look if you dare. I met Emily, this wonderful, elegant person. Our sons brought us together, actually. Come here, little dude. Can we a Simple Favor, directed by Paul Feig, is based on Darcy Bell's 2017 novel where mummy blogger Stephanie tries to find her rich best friend who's gone missing in a small town. The film starring Anna Kendrick, Blake Lively and Henry Golding blends suspense with love, betrayal and plenty of style. The trailer doesn't give much away and at the film's world premiere in New York, the stars were equally tight-lipped. When I read the script, I, that's the thing, like, there's so many twists that, like, you figure it out, but then, like, that's not the end of it. There's so many more twists and turns, so, I mean, that's what made it exciting, is that, like, it had so many, like, avenues and things you weren't expecting that it kind of kept you on your toes until the very end. Since last May, Blake Lively has used her Instagram account to promote the film. And she's liked her character Emily Nelson so much that for a couple of days she only followed her random namesakes. Because I really liked her. I mean, I think that every villain is the hero in their own story. You know, I'm probably butchering it. It's probably a version of that. But, um, you know, she, she did what she did for a reason that we, Paul and I, were able to understand and, and empathize with. And she's just fun to play. She's just so delicious. And I love that. I love that she's not uh, self-apologetic. Director Paul Feig warns the audience to expect a lot of twists. Basically, I'd say it's, it's what I call suburban noir. It's, it's really the story of two unlikely uh, friends. A friendship grows between these two very different women, and then one of them disappears, and the other one's got to figure out what happened. Okay. And a lots of twists and turns, and a lot of fun happens in, within that. Dark fun, but fun. I thought you knew more than you were letting on. A Simple Favour is set to be released in the UK on the 20th of September. Abraham Lincoln said, if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And Adam McKay's latest movie, Vice, is out to discover if the 46th Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, had too much of it. What do you say? I want you to be my VP. I want you. You're my bias. Dick Cheney was the controversial second man to George W. Bush. He became the most powerful vice president in U.S. history and used his influence in the decision to invade Iraq. Cheney is portrayed by Christian Bale, who's famous for undergoing dramatic transformations for almost all of his movies. For Vice, Bale gained around 20 kilos, and his makeup makes him almost unrecognizable. Understanding. I can handle the more mundane jobs, overseeing bureaucracy, military, energy, and uh, foreign policy. And some say this was his most challenging role yet. I don't know why man, I'm doing that again. I, I kept on saying, no, I can't, I can't do that again. But, uh, you know, it's uh, Adam McKay and I worked with him on Big Short. And the bastard went and wrote a really good script. And um, I kept on trying to find reasons why, how I could say no. And uh, he always had an answer uh, for me about why I shouldn't. And they were good answers. And uh, eventually went, ah, oh, damn it, he's right. I've got to do it. I've got to do it. Yeah. Are you even more ruthless than you used to be?
Vice is described by the writer and director Adam McKay as a snapshot into Dick Cheney's wild, quiet and shadowy power. And it hits U.S. theaters on the 21st of December. So we're going to do this thing or what? I mean, is this happening? I believe we can make this work. <laughs> Hot damn. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Showcase. Make sure to join us again tomorrow, where we'll bring you the latest from the 62nd BFI London Film Festival. Until then, you can check out our YouTube channel for more of our stories from the international art scene. I'm Efnan Han. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.